story one. Preface, my cousin demanded that I buy him a car because I have money and he does not. I refuse, which made him angry and he threatened to sue me. To the story, I received a call from my uncle in Europe informing me that my entitled cousin had filed a lawsuit against me, apparently for breach of contract. To clarify, I never signed any agreement stating I would buy him a car, nor did I ever verbally agree to do so. However, he is claiming that we had an oral agreement and that I promised to buy him a car. Concerned, I called the local police station to verify the situation. Unfortunately, the officers at this precinct seemed somewhat uninformed, I don't mean to imply that all police officers are lacking in knowledge, just that these particular ones seem to be. When I called to inquire about the matter, the officer on the phone confirmed that my cousin had indeed filed a police report. He then asked me to come to the station that day to give my statement. I tried to explain that I lived in the United States and couldn't simply show up. But the officer interrupted me, insisting that I had to come down to the station. The conversation went as follows. Sir, I need you to come to the station so we can take your official statement. That is impossible. Officer, you see, I... Sir, when the police request your presence, you must comply. Otherwise, we have the authority to arrest you for evading official police business. Officer, I literally can't make it. I live. What is your full name, sir? I gave him my full legal name. Date of birth? I provided my date of birth. Social security number? I gave him my European social security number. To clarify, the social security number in Europe is not linked to finances, but rather to health insurance. It is as unique as the social security number in the US. However, I hadn't used that number in nine years and the account has no current mailing address. This becomes relevant in the next part of the conversation. Sir, I can't find a current address. It is unlawful not to have your primary legal residence registered. What is your current address? And you will be fined for not keeping your records up to date. May I speak now, or are you going to continue cutting me off? Watch your tone, sir, or you'll be fined for disrespecting law enforcement. At this point, I was frustrated and gave him my address in the United States. He responded that the address was non-existent in Europe. My address is X Sesame Street, X State. Sir, this is your final warning. Give me your legal address here in Europe, or we will issue an all-points bulletin for your person. At this point, I lost my patience. It was 3 a.m., and I was dealing with someone who had likely never left his state, perhaps even his county. Listen here, officer, I live in the United States of America and have done so for the past nine years. For the past 10 minutes, I've been trying to explain that it is physically impossible for me to show up at your station. I will not buy a last-minute ticket and spend thousands of dollars just to tell you my side of this dispute. Now, if you and your local police station want to buy me a ticket and pay for room and board, I will be happy to get on a plane. Otherwise, I will give you my side over the phone, and you can fax me the papers to my office. I will sign the statement and send it back to you. Your choice. Oh, I understand. Well, okay then, please tell me what happened and we will finish up via fax. After he finally grasped the situation, I provided my statement and asked if he knew how much my cousin was suing me for. The kicker, he is suing me for the loss of the car's value, emotional stress, and loss of income because, apparently, his old car broke down a month ago and he couldn't get to work. He is suing me for roughly $140,000, $80,000 for the car, $3,000 for loss of income, and $57,000 for emotional stress. Fortunately, my uncle has a friend whose son is a lawyer, and he is willing to take my case. My uncle also went to the Jeep dealership to talk to the sales representative who was present when my cousin demanded the car. The representative said he would testify in my defense. Initially, I thought about ignoring this situation, but since the country where my family lives is part of the European Union, I don't want to risk getting arrested the next time I land in Germany, Austria, or Paris. I know this is just a manipulative tactic by my cousin to pressure me into buying him that car, but it won't work on me. After this, I am done with him and his side of the family. I have a business trip coming up next week in Switzerland and will stay a bit longer to deal with this situation in person. First Update 
I just got off the phone with my lawyer, who informed me that the case will most likely go to court and will not be dismissed. As I understand it, there is a rule that if a complainant claims a monetary reimbursement of over 120,000 euros, it has to go to trial. This also explains how my cousin came up with those arbitrary numbers. To clarify, $140,000 is roughly 120 20, 125,000 euros, depending on the exchange rate. However, there is some hopeful news. My lawyer knows my cousin's lawyer and mentioned that his firm has had a few cases against him, all of which he lost. My lawyer is optimistic that he can pressure my cousin to withdraw the claims once the trial starts. I will speak with my lawyer again on Wednesday and hopefully have an update by then. Second update. My lawyer spoke with the prosecutor's office and set up an appointment for a questioning session on Monday. He also talked with my cousin's lawyer, who indicated that my cousin is willing to resolve the matter privately rather than in front of a judge. My cousin's lawyer said they would be satisfied with a payment of 100,000 euros. Naturally, my lawyer declined, as I instructed him to do. I would rather burn my money than give him a single cent. Additionally, my cousin's lawyer hasn't provided sufficient evidence. While my lawyer sat with the sales representative from the Jeep dealership in the prosecutor's office to give his statement, my lawyer is more confident that the prosecutor's office will drop the case because the only evidence my cousin's lawyer has is my cousin's word. My lawyer asked if anyone else was present when I allegedly agreed to buy my cousin a car. Unfortunately, it was just me and him. My lawyer is also preparing a countersuit against my cousin for when the lawsuit against me is dropped or won. It seems that this ordeal will soon be over. Most of my family is on my side, though my grandmother is torn because she fears this matter is tearing the family apart. I forgive her for not avoiding my cousin and his side of the family. She is 86 years old and just wants to live the rest of her days in peace. I hope to have this matter resolved in the next two weeks. I have other things to worry about, such as my upcoming wedding, and I still haven't figured out why I'm so nervous and scared about getting married. Thanks for reading, everyone, and have a great day. Story 2 The Christmas season tends to remind me of this story. I'm pretty sure this is the right place to share it, so let's get to it. One quick note, I was very young when this happened, so this is all second-hand information, as my mom told me the story. Almost 20 years ago, I was a small child, either four or five years old, and undergoing treatment for a serious illness. Our community was incredibly supportive, as were various charities fellow Americans know how hard healthcare costs can hit. A local pizza chain set up a donation collection box to help my family with the medical expenses. The employees generously put a significant portion of their tips into this collection box, which was incredibly kind of them. This all took place in December. My mom told me that we had stopped by the store with a donation box to drop off some cookies and treats for the employees. We chatted for a bit and then left. I think it was the next day when my mom received a call from one of the managers asking how much money was in the donation box. Apparently, they needed the information for tax purposes. My mom was confused because, as far as we knew, the donation box was still at the store. It turns out that a family friend had shown up at the store a few hours after we left, claimed to be my mom, and said she needed the donations immediately. The employees handed over the box to her, which I can't blame them for, as it was probably a busy time. In the end, the family friend took $701,000, and we never heard from her again. My mom suspects the woman had twins, so I can only hope she used the money to give them a good Christmas. Unfortunately, there's no satisfying ending to this story, aside from the fact that I am now in remission. Thanks for reading! Story 3 I have a full-time day job, but I also do a couple of side gigs, including driving for a ride-sharing service. Last night, after my day job, I decided to do some driving for extra money. One writer decided they wanted to sit right behind me, which isn't terribly uncommon, especially for women who prefer to sit there for safety reasons. However, the person I picked up was a tall man who went around my car to get into the rear driver's side door. It would have been easier for him to get in through the passenger side door, but I didn't think much of it at the time. I immediately noticed that he was very tall. I'm not particularly tall, but I'm not short either. 
I drive a Honda Civic, so my seat is further back than the front passenger's seat, which means there's less room behind me. I also drive a manual transmission, which is important to this story. As soon as he got in, I mentioned that he might have more room on the other side and that he was free to sit there if he wanted. He just grunted in acknowledgement. I encounter people like that all the time, where you say something to them, and they clearly just don't want to talk, so I didn't think much of it. We got going down the road, and I could see in my rearview mirror that he was paying attention to what my hand was doing. Then, the conversation began. Yeah, I need you to move your seat up because I need more legroom. Sorry, man, I can't move it up because I need legroom to be able to drive. If you want more legroom, feel free to move over to the passenger side, and I can even move that seat up a bit for you if needed. No, I want to sit here. I'm the passenger, and I'm paying you, so I'm going to sit where I want. All right, but I can't move my seat up. You are so unprofessional. You just don't want to move it up because you want all the legroom for yourself. Unlike cars you might be used to, I have to shift this car manually. I don't have that much legroom, but I have just enough to make sure I can shift and brake reliably. I don't care. Move your seat up, or I'm going to give you a one-star rating. At this point, I started looking for somewhere to pull over and kick this guy out of my car because I wasn't in the mood for this nonsense. Go right ahead, man. Your one-star rating isn't going to have much effect against the 500 ratings I already have. However, my one-star rating against your 100 ratings is going to have an effect, and we'll see what the ride-sharing service has to say about the dashcam footage I'm going to submit right after this ride. I don't give you permission to record me, so you can't use it. Sorry, man, but in this state, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy inside a ride-sharing vehicle, as stated by legal precedents. So, you're being kicked out of my car and this footage is going to be sent to the ride-sharing service. Now get out of my car. He started grumbling and muttering, but eventually got out of my car. I was expecting him to cause more trouble, but the gas station I pulled over it happened to have a police officer present, which probably convinced him not to cause any more issues. I don't understand how people think they can get into someone's privately owned vehicle and then treat them like a servant. Some people believe they have all the power just because they are paying a company that then pays us. It's made worse by the fact that unless a driver can prove that a rider was unreasonable, we're often left in a difficult position. The ride-sharing service doesn't care about drivers nearly as much as they probably should, and riders know they can use the rating system to try to hurt us. Story 4. I am fuming. I'm still so angry that my hands are shaking. Background, my husband's sister and I don't get along. We are polar opposites, and she is a social activist to the extreme. For example, when I became pregnant with her nephew, she suggested I consider not going through with the pregnancy so that I could experience the pride of such a choice. She and her husband are also fairly wealthy and live about two hours away from us. Story time. My husband had an untreated hernia that he had lived with for almost eight years because, as a typical stubborn man, it wasn't bothering him too much. However, a couple of weeks ago, the hernia suddenly caused him unbearable pain, which was a shock to both of us. I drove him 45 minutes to the emergency room and dropped him off. We live in a small town far from civilization, and I didn't want to drag three sleepy kids into the emergency room at 10 p.m. An hour later, he called to inform me that they were transferring him two hours away to a larger hospital for emergency surgery, as that was where the surgeon was. I spoke briefly to the doctor at the small hospital, who explained that waiting for the surgeon to come to the small hospital would not be a good idea. Because of my job and the kids, I couldn't go to the larger hospital, so I called my sister-in-law, who lives near the hospital, and asked her to meet the ambulance and update me. So, I waited and waited, and waited, but I received no update. The next morning, I still hadn't heard anything, so I texted her. Nothing. By this time, I was at work, freaking out. I called the large hospital, explained the situation, and asked for an update. The nurse checked the computer and informed me that my husband was still in surgery. Now, I was really freaking out. I texted my sister-in-law again. Nothing. Two hours later, I called the hospital again and got this response. He's out of surgery, but we can't tell you any more than that because you're not listed as his emergency contact. 
I said, but I'm his wife, and I would like to know if my husband is okay. By this point, I was crying. I'm sorry, ma'am, but until you're added to the list, I cannot provide any more information. Yes, my sister-in-law had put only herself down as the emergency contact. At this point, I called my mom, sobbing. She told me it was probably a mistake and suggested I call the hospital back to see if they could page my sister-in-law. So I did, and they did. I thought I would get to talk to her, but they just asked her if I could be added as a contact. She agreed, and the staff transferred me to my husband's nurse. The nurse informed me that my husband was in recovery but still groggy. I asked about the surgery, and she looked at his chart and said, the surgeon's notes indicate that he already updated the family. I replied, no, I'm his wife, and until now, I didn't even know if he was alive. The nurse sounded confused but explained that the surgery had lasted five hours and was more serious than anticipated. In fact, they almost lost him twice, cue me sobbing again. Fast forward four days. My husband was still in the hospital, but he had been keeping me updated. I finally got the chance to visit him with the kids. When we arrived, my sister-in-law had just gone for lunch. I didn't want to upset my husband, so I didn't tell him what had happened. Then she returned, gave me a fake smile, and told my four-year-old daughter that her pink dress was pretty, but that, you know you can wear pants in blue if you want to. I rolled my eyes. She then proceeded to tell me that she had already decided that my husband was going to stay at her house for six weeks after being discharged so that she could take care of him because I couldn't even be bothered to visit him. I was shocked and looked at my husband. He looked shocked as well. I was about to speak when my husband said, Um, I don't think so. I appreciate you being here, but I am going home with my family. She couldn't be here because of her job and the kids. She became angry at that and left. And I just noticed that she has blocked me on all social media. If you made it this far, thank you. I really needed to vent.